So thank you very much for the patience. I hope that uh, it, 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 it was worthwhile. So I introduce myself, um, and I'm very happy to chair the first session of today, which is on FinTech. Uh, to my knowledge, this is one of the first FinTech uh, sessions at Competition Economics Conferences, so I'm really happy uh, because of that. Uh, first, I would like to start uh, with introducing uh, our distinguished uh, panelists. Uh, I will start uh, with the ladies. First, uh, I will start with Natalia Prisistash, who is uh, head of legal at the Norwegian fintech company AUKA, who is uh, offering a PSD2 compliant technology platform for banks, and banks can use this platform to provide white label payment services to their clients. Then, next to her, we have uh, Noemi Pop who is uh, head of digital and retail from the European uh, Banking Federation. And then uh, we have um, Elvira Allende Rodriguez, partner at uh, Sherman and Sterling, the co-organizer of uh, the conference. And then we, we get to the two gentlemen that, uh, whom we have here. First is uh, Jonas Hedman, who is, uh, he, he is a professor in the Department of Digitalization of the Copenhagen Business School. And uh, last but not least, we have uh, uh, Vite uh, Wiesmüller from the Cloud and Software uh, Unit of DigiConnect, and he is member of the Commission's FinTech Task Force. So I think that we have the right experts in the right number, and I'm looking forward to an exciting uh, chat or discussion. Okay, so FinTech. FinTech is a buzzword. Uh, everybody is using it, people are talking about it. But you know, we, we still don't have a good definition. So the, the question arises, what is fintech, right? So fintech is this. You can see, okay, I can, I can give a more formal uh, definition, is the entering of digital technology into the various areas of financial services, starting from payments to consumer lending, institutional investments, banking infrastructure, everything. And you can see that in each of these areas, there are a number of companies, some smaller ones, some bigger ones. Uh, and uh, so if, 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 if you want to enter this market, then you will have difficulties in giving a name to your company. But then you are very lucky because there's a website called FinTech Name Generator that can help you with coming up with the, with the right name, okay? So, uh, you, 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 may, you may think and the, that, that if, if it's such a versatile market with so many players, then you know, if, you, if, you, if your scrutiny is strong enough, you may identify some competition issues. But it's very difficult to start at this level, so I think it's very, it, it, it helps if we look at the financial services value chain. So the value chain is always helpful when you want to identify this, uh, these problems, and I will start with the uh, banking, uh, banking service value chain, so you have the retail and commercial banking on the top. Okay, this is the layer that has direct uh, contact to final consumers who are then using payment and other services. And this retail and commercial banking is standing on the shoulders of wholesale bankings and whole wholesale markets, okay? And then there is even one, one uh, level deeper, which is the wholesale payments uh, scene and then the clearing and settlement infrastructure. But so what is interesting that first you would think that, that the fintechs, they only enter at the retail level, but if I push this button, then you will see that actually fintech companies enter at every single layer. What is, what is interesting that, uh, that yes, they did enter individual layers, but there are not, uh, it, it, it's not very, very characteristic that they entered through the entire value chain. And we can see that this, this can, uh, can have uh, consequences for, uh, for competition. So once we are done with this, um, I would like to, to, to start the discussion, okay, and I will turn to, to my fellow panelists. And the first question that I'm raising is that uh, it, 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 uh, this, this is a scene where there are basically three types of players. One of them are the traditional banks who are facing very heavy regulations, so one could think that this is a uh, a disadvantage in competition, and then you have these fintechs that are thought to be very agile, and then you know you, you have the big techs, as, as Tomaso just described. And I would like to ask, what is your opinion about? Is there a level playing field, or how 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 is the competition in this scene? So, uh, Natalia, if you if you would like to come. 
Thank you. So uh, I strongly believe that uh, the level of uh, compliance you have to maintain if you are a fintech company depends on the type of the services you are offering. And if you are offering a service which is very complementary, is just fitting on one of the levels of the diag diagram you've shown, and doesn't really add any value, then it might be, I can imagine, that uh, you may not be required to, com uh, to, com to be compliant with any uh, particular regulations, but then I don't see how such fintech would be competitive in the market, because frankly, to build a similar solution by the bank is not uh, a problem at all. When it comes to more advanced solutions, such as our solution, Auka is offering mobile payment solution, when we are uh, maybe not as strongly as banks, but we have a lot of uh, compliance responsibilities. We were the first, first company in Europe to gain a, a license under PSD1, the Payment Institutions License. We are, uh, just like mentioned at the beginning, fully PSD2 compliant. We are um, under the supervision uh, uh, of uh, Financial Supervisory Authority. Uh, in Norway, who granted us e-money license uh, that we passported all over the Europe, so we are um, able to operate all over the Europe. Even more, um, because of the nature of our operation, we are actually being quite innovative also in terms of uh, compliance, because one of the um, uh, one of the um, requests from the FSA uh, in order to grant us a license was to get um, a customized um, agreement with Google. Our service is offered on a SaaS model and we are operating fully in public cloud and this is uh, Google Cloud and we are the first company in the world to do that. So we were required to get a customized agreement with Google when Norwegian FSA could enter Google premises and investigate if anything has happened. So I wouldn't call it a lack of compliance. I would just say that, yes, we are less compliant than banks, but now we are reached uh, to the moment that we are looking for banks as partners, but frankly, we don't need any bank to offer our solution. <laughs> Yes, first of all, I, I, if I may, would just, just to react also to the statement which has been uh, made uh, as an introduction. I would not say that the banks are, um, do not like fintech. Uh, first, banks are fintech, uh, as mentioned clearly by the definition. And I would say now we are like moving from like this old-fashioned uh, thinking of like banks versus fintech to collaboration, as just stressed. Uh, partnership and maybe acquisition, that's for sure. And and it's how we see, and of course they are complementary. Uh, we cannot see the, say the contrary. Um, in terms of level playing field, as it has been mentioned uh, previously, indeed banks ha are heavily regulated. It's like, of course, I'm not saying that it's not for good reasons. After the financial crisis, there were like uh, new solutions which have to be put in place. Banks have to indeed to comply to many legislation, retail banking, but also wholesale banking, supervision. So it's like heavy legislation. Also in terms of like uh, anti-money laundering, fraud prevention, cyber security risk, which are increasing now. Um, so I would say, like, indeed, banks are heavily regulated, and what is key is, like, this level playing field, meaning, like, we should not look at this environment only uh, based on the infrastructure or the business models. It's what is important is the activity, and it's what consumers are uh, looking for, and uh, we are encouraging, of course, the policy makers, legislature also to look at that. So that means looking at same supervision, same regulation. Um, so meaning same supervision, same services, same activities and same security. So but we see also differences that we cannot deny the fact that indeed banks are heavily regulated when these new players also active on the market are not complying to the same rules because they have they are maybe not a li licensed, for example, or like business models are evolving. And I also wanted to touch um, as a good example, um, it's like in terms of anti-money laundering rules, cyber security uh, risk, but also cloud computing. I think it's a very good example. We see like banks cannot easily access uh, cloud computing solution 
I'm talking here about public and hybrid cloud solution, not private cloud, because of course banks develop that like very easily. <coughs> Um, but it's like moving to new solutions. And, and here we see that it's not only a question of regulation or supervision, it's also a question of like mentality and making sure that the national supervisory authorities have maybe an upper another perspective, not only the financial stability angle, but also the innovative angle. And meaning like also that we see different rules according to different member states and of course the European Banking Authority uh, with the recent recommendation on cloud outsourcing was like already trying to harmonize in this direction. So that's kind of concrete examples that we face. Um, I'm not here calling for like everyone should be regulated. I'm just saying that we should look at the legislation and maybe adapt them to the digital reality. So from a competition perspective, um, of course, this is a regulation uh, question, so there's not so much, but just a, a few points that are actually relevant as well for what we will discuss later and, and picking up on, on what Noemi just said and also what Tommaso was saying before. So for competition, it is a matter as well of what is the um, value of the re this regulation. And basically, we can see that there's two main interests that we're balancing here. And so we have, from one side, um, what the competition um, aims will be, you know, to increase competition, to have more innovation in the market. And then on the other side, of course, we have the consumer protection and privacy and all those other um, very important principles. So. From a competition perspective, I think what is very, very interesting and is something very new and, and those of you that follow this issue know very well about is, of course, we have now the revised payment service directive. And so it is very important to know that, you know, coming out of that possibility that is just now very new and, and starting, what we see there is that actually there is um, a monopoly that is ending and it's true that banks used to have the possibility, um, they were the only ones that could deal with payment services and, and that is no longer going to be the case, so it's going to be open now to other ones. And so the importance of regulation is, of course, what we have heard from the both of you, to, to um, draw the right balance and, and not to um, give more importance to one principle against the other. From a competition perspective, of course, what we really want to see as well is that um, that is also not, um, not if you want, um, taking from the other side and that the uh, banks that have been there for a longer time take advantage of, of that to try and, and block others from coming. But that is for a, a later, I think, of our points. Okay, from, um, from an academic point of view, what I have observed, and particularly from Denmark and Sweden, is that we have seen a shift in the view of competition. So when we started to investigate prior, it was called FinTech in 2008, mobile payments, uh, the banks were scared in particular of PayPal. They thought they would, could potentially ruin the business, but luckily eBay bought them, so nothing happened. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, then, then what is his kind of interesting, I think the, how we use FinTech now, we bundle all kinds of financial services, payment, wealth management, pension funds, and all kinds of stuff, and that is kind of wrong, even though they have one in common thing, and that is shuffling money. So we do, so I think the most interesting part from a broad competitive perspective is basically look at the banking structure, the incumbents, uh, which doesn't really have any competition in England. Luckily, they're leaving Europe, so we don't have that issue any longer. Germany, that has a really nice distributed banking sector with a lot of small banks that tries to help society. We have Denmark, I would say, also have a fairly many banks, even though some of them are quite big. Sweden are in the kind of in the yeah, the not in the good spot because there are very few, very strong banks, and that delimits uh, say competition. So, and I, but I think then the interesting part is whether the big techs or the internet giants will enter the market. We have seen some trials, I would say, from Apple at least, uh, Facebook as well. They might come, they might not come. It probably depends on the potential gains that they have and risk of being more regulated. And that is a major trade-off for them uh, over time to decide where to go. It might be better to leave the tough battles with the central banks to the banks because they have the knowledge of doing that. 
Well, thank you very much, Norbert, first of all, for, uh, for inviting uh, me to be here. Um, from a European Commission perspective, and definitely not a uh, competition European Commission mm. perspective, because I represent DG Connect, let's say the tech DG of the European Commission. So um, my colleague uh, giving the, the keynote speech uh, before uh, addressed more the, the competition uh, side uh, from our institution. Uh, but from a European Commission perspective, the, the answer to the, um, to the level playing field question is, is also rather simple. I think it depends on the products or services that a company, whether it's a bank or a fintech or any other new tech company offers, uh, how, uh, how this entity will be regulated, whether at EU level, uh, whether at national level or not regulated at all, which is also an option. Uh, on the latter, uh, we have seen that, for example, peer-to-peer -peer lending and, uh, and crowdfunding uh, services uh, were not uh, regulated at EU level. Uh, and the Commission, together with the FinTech Action Plan, has done a proposal for a regulation to start an EU framework on this. So crowdfunding, peer-to-peer -peer lending. Um, also, I would say that aside from that, we are, by the beginning of next year, inviting the ESAS uh, to come up with a mapping of uh, regulatory and license, uh, licensing approaches uh, to uh, FinTech uh, in Europe to see how the principles of proportionality and flexibility of financial services legislation in Europe uh, are being addressed, uh, because that's basically what it's about. Uh, we want to have as much as, as possible a single market, you want to have a capital markets union, a digital single market, so that means that you have to have some kind of convergence or harmonization. Um, just briefly answering to what Noemi was saying on cloud, I must, of course, representing the cloud unit, uh, also in terms of supervisory convergence, we have been working uh, with the ESAS and we're very happy that the EBA has done these uh, recommendations on outsourcing to cloud. Um, we are continuing to work with them and also as a part of the FinTech Action Plan we will make sure that uh, we'll work on uh, model contract clauses uh, for the financial industry specifically uh, in their relationship with cloud service providers to make it easier uh, and to make it the legal certainty higher for banks to be able to outsource uh, to, to uh, cloud services because indeed this is a very, uh, very important uh, issue, and it's uh, coming from a real mentality, uh, I think, uh, issue not only with banks, but also with uh, national supervisors and uh, regulators. So we're working on that. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I think that you touched upon a number of issues that will come up later in, 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 in uh, later rounds. I will try to, to force that through. Um, so this first question was more about a general view of a feeling of level playing field. So now I would like to take the initiative to dig a bit deeper. Uh, I, um, I, I prepared three questions. Uh, two are from the area of antitrust of competition and one is uh, related to merger. So but I, will, I will start with antitrust. The reason why I'm starting with antitrust because I, you, you, you still might uh, remember the value chain that I showed and it, it shows that uh, if, if you want to offer some of these services, you need to rely on certain, certain inputs that are provided by other players in the market. And actually there are quite, quite a number of these various type of inputs that, that you need access to. You can think of, let's say, you need access to current account data of customers, of consumers, if you, which, which is controlled by banks. You may need access to, uh, to mobile communication, infrastructure, hardware and software or you may need access to various type of consumer data which is not necessarily controlled by, uh, by banks, or you also may need uh, access to the cloud, you know, because that, 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 that's where you can do, do quite a lot of, of your, your activity. So, and then if there is a competition between all these players in the market and all, the, all those players who are controlling or owning some of this infrastructure, they, they might have, an, they, they, they have the ability and might have the incentive to enter into the market. I would like to ask uh, the, the question to what extent you think that this access to infrastructure can, can evolve in the future or it can be, become even stronger and, and, and that, that, that it could give a word to the competition authorities. So if you don't mind now, we start on that front to just maintain the level playing field and also <laughs> optimize attention. 
very yeah. good that we're maintaining also our internal level playing field. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I think two things uh, from my side when it comes to, uh, to the resources that you uh, were mentioning. I'd like to focus on data and on cloud. Um, well, we're coming, of course, from, from the situation now that you see that the whole society is digitalizing, and I mean every sector, so we're not speaking about an ICT sector anymore, and you know, every sector is, as you know, is, is based on digital processes. Um, so that means that data processing, and therefore uh, the data processing you do in the cloud often, is at the core, is at the fundament of our economy. Um, and that means that because that's becoming so critical and, and nearly systemic uh, in the future, that you have to ensure that the, the market for cloud services or the market for data processing, let me say it like that, is also fluid in Europe and uh, that it's a competitive and, uh, and healthy market. Uh, now, when you look at the provision of cloud services, uh, you can ask questions about that. I'm not going to answer them, but it is uh, a fact that uh, the cloud market is quite consolidated, uh, specifically also the public cloud market. Um, so what we are doing um, and, and, and what we are seeing is that it's uh, predominantly also a problem of uh, what my predecessor said in the, in the keynote, data portability. So it's, it's a question of are you able to switch easily from one cloud service provider to another? Um, or not. Now, if you, if you think about that question, and we did a study on it, and, and we, we got the answer from the study at least, which I will share with you uh, in a minute. But if you think from that, uh, like from that angle, it's clear that, I mean, the society is digitalizing only recently, right? So, I mean, last 10, 15 years, and it's, it's of course growing exponentially. So also the data volumes that we're generating, that we're storing, that we're processing. Think also of, of, of well, close to banking, high frequency trading, uh, developments like that is growing. So once a, let's say, a, a financial actor joined a certain cloud service provider, uh, maybe the data volume that he or uh, well, that, that, the, that, the, uh, that the entity was dealing with was much smaller than at a time now, the time has come to switch because there may be more optimal services uh, provided by another cloud service provider. So then you are confronted with a situation of a massive amount of data, you need to switch to another cloud service provider. What kind of network bandwidth do you need for that? How long uh, may it take? Uh, how long are your services interrupted? Which can, can be a real economic uh, uh, consideration. So we've, we've done this study and it, uh, it, it, it turned out that basically the legal uncertainty about switching is very high. So cloud contracts between, so the contracts between, we, between banks and cloud service providers, 0% uh, of the, the contracts that we, uh, we studied actually specified in which format the data should be in order to, uh, to port it. And 60% did not specify the data retention time, for example, after the termination of a contract. So, so what we've done with the free flow of non-personal data regulation, which was, uh, um, which was communicated in 2017, September, and we have already a political agreement uh, now since June. So the uh, entry into force will be in December. Uh, we've been working on that uh, uh, the, uh, the very, uh, very intensively the last year. Uh, what we've done with this regulation is we've put a self-regulatory effort to this. So we'll have a switching and porting working group um, by the industry, to which also uh, financial uh, sector uh, participants are joining, that will determine codes of conduct for switching and porting. So that's, that's one thing. So I think that it's, it's important that the cloud services, uh, that you address that. And on data, yeah, data access is hugely important. Data access is very important, not only for the financial uh, sector and for the financial industry, but across the economy, of course. It's exactly why uh, the PSD2 regulation uh, that, that we discussed before uh, ha has been revised. Um, this is, of course, not a, a, like I said, a financial issue. It's, you see it across the economy, and that's why we also, as the Commission, uh, are facilitating in all kinds of ways uh, the data access for different sectors by, for example, having a data uh, s uh, sharing support center. Um, 
offering model contract clauses for parties that private parties that liked to engage in B2B data sharing, uh, fostering the use of standardized APIs. And I think that's the way, from a commission perspective, we are looking at it and we're trying to at least help these resources uh, to share them better across the market. Okay, uh, so uh, I'm not an economist. Uh, I know that economists they look into uh, platforms or the financial market from as a two-sided perspective. Uh, but uh, I do. That is a really nice perspective. But me, as an information systems researcher, we look at as more kind of from a point of view of design principles or architecture. And I think this is kind of important related to both PST2, but also to the access of the infrastructure. So we talk about something called generativity, uh, how to make the infrastructure or the platforms more accessible or more modular, so that more participants can, say, access the infrastructure. Of course, that comes to the data as well. So we know what kind of, yeah, the format of the data and stuff like that. Uh, so I think there are the complementary views from different, say, disciplines on how to view this platform economization that it occurs in all the industries, basically. And I think we can draw from different disciplines to understand how we can f maybe shape legislations in a way so they become more open and accessible for a broader array of firms, instead of you having a purely, say, two-sided view on platforms. So that is how we approach it from my discipline, more as a how to create them, make them more, say, open, generative, and that's how the Payment Service Directive 2 fits quite in to forcing the banks to open up their platforms. So from a competition perspective here, um, here we're talking about, uh, about access to data, and yes, of course, that um, is, a main, is a main topic um, when we're talking about fintechs and, and how the sphere is going to be changing in the near future. So um, just so uh, everybody uh, is reminded here, the, um, the issue that we're talking about is that banks are the ones that own and have our account data information. And so by definition, then they are dominant and they have that information that nobody else has. So there is a problem uh, with this and what, how this has been looked at. For example, how the Commission has been looking at this. So we have, of course, the, the revised PSD2 and that's one of the big aims of the regulation. So opening up and now third parties can actually have access to that account information and actually provide um, services that previously were provided by banks. Now that is open and third parties can enter there. The European Commission um, approximately year, a year and, and a little bit uh, ago actually um, did inspections. They did downgrade uh, two member states in the Netherlands and in <coughs> Poland and they were actually looking at this particular issue on data access. They um, did down rates on the banks um, under the suspicion that there was an infringement and actually it's very interesting because they were looking at it from both a perspective of Article 101 and restrictive agreements but also an abuse of a dominant position um, by saying that the banks, um, despite the, the um, consumers having granted access to these third parties, third parties non-bank-owned uh, non um, financial service providers, um, they, the banks were ex still uh, blocking them from obtaining this um, banking um, account information. And, and we don't know what's happening with this case. We know the Commission did this inspection. So it is a very good example because it shows how access to um, this is actually very, um, very important and it's a, a big priority on what the Commission is, is looking at. Um, of course, this was previous to, to the revised um, payment service uh, directive uh, bit, but it shows that it goes in the same way. The second interesting thing in here, I think, is um, uh, in the sense of hardware and software. So we, we have seen um, very recently, and actually just this month, uh, a debate that has happened uh, within the parliament in which the commissioner, Vestager, had to reply to a question that was put to her um, uh, through, uh, through various actors in which basically um, she needed to debate on whether um, Apple Pay um, was right under our competition rules to uh, <coughs> be denying access to their near-field communication controller and whether that was um, in line with, um, with competition rules. So it's very interesting to see 
uh, how does this work? So basically how Apple Pay and Apple Wallet work is that they have this NFC, which is embedded in the mobile phone. It is not something that goes to the cloud. Some other um, companies have that. So um, Google, Google Pay and Samsung Pay have that in the cloud. Um, Apple has it in the mobile device. And basically they do not give access to let's say the banks that want to, to have to, to put their own apps into that particular NFC technology so that if banks want to offer something that is competing, they actually have to put a tag on the back of the iPhone so that that um, contactless payment can happen. <coughs> so we're talking about mobile payments, we're talking about this NFC, and basically what the commissioner said is very interesting. They said, of course, we acknowledge that this is an issue. We, we're looking at that and we're following it very closely, but what we see, and that's the commissioner's words, is that there is still competition. As I just said, there's other companies that are offering the same service, so you have Google Pay and you have Samsung Pay. But also there's other uh, instruments that don't have to necessarily go towards cards, so you have other, um, other ways of paying with the mobile that go th through your bank account, for example, or that go to, um, to the mobile operator billing. Um, and so those are two things that, that are ongoing. On this particular point on, of Apple Pay, it's very interesting as well, uh, and from those of you that have been following the debate very closely, there was a decision last year by the Australian Competition Commission um, that actually targeted this, and so a number of, of big banks in Australia, which had around 65% of the, <laughs> of the market there, came to the competition authority and asked them if they could collectively bargain um, with Apple to try and, and have access to this NFC uh, technology. So the, the issue will be that they could put their, their, um, their apps directly without having to use the Apple Pay. It's exactly the same thing as the debate that we were having and the question that was put to the commissioner here. And it's very interesting to see that they not only asked for that, but they, they also said, and, and we want to um, also ask for a possibility of actually boycotting um, Apple Pay until this debate of collective bargaining is done. And so a very long decision afterwards, basically bottom line, what the Australian Competition Authority said is that, that they didn't see a benefit on doing that and that actually, as a matter of fact, among many, many other things, because the decision is very long and actually they take it from every, every possible uh, way of looking at it, what they come to, to saying is, well, look, if you look at what the banks and their apps will be doing, um, they will be privileging, of course, their own cards and the, and the ones that are owned by the bank. Whereas if we look at what Apple Pay is doing is they are putting all the other cards there. And so in a way, there is more choice for the consumer afterwards when we have Apple Pay and they can choose from all of them. So at the end of the day, they, they decided not to grant that collective bargaining and that um, collective boycotting. And, and so I think it's, it's interesting to see uh, because in a way it's more advanced than the debate in Europe and it gives us a little bit of all the problems and, and the problematic that is out there with this debate, which is, you know, we, we have to look at it from the point of view of, you know, is there interoperability issues, um, do we have access to the issues, and, and all those things depend on how, of course, the assessment is done on whether the company is dominant and whether it is abusing the dominant position. All these are debates that, you know, this is the normal assessment that we do in competition. The only thing that is different is the technology and, you know, the fintechs are, are new. Uh, um, and so it's interesting to look at them and see what the commission is doing and, and the other um, authorities are doing in relation to that. So, <laughs> of course, uh, I may have to react to uh, some of the <laughs> points you have. <laughs> because, uh, so first, uh, wha what I, I believe it's important to, to look at um, from two perspectives. Of course, you have like the DG competition as an enforcement body, but you know that DG competition is also a competition policy body as well. Absolutely. So then here we see like a bit of combination here. Um, I will not, of course, touch the issue of the, those, those uh, ongoing um, work conducted by DG competition with these done rates. Um, uh, and you refer to uh, Article uh, 102 about like uh, abuse of dominant position. Of course, that doesn't mean that they be necessarily it's about abuse of dominant position. Of course, that could be also like extending the scope like for the investigation, I would say like 101, 102. Um, but what is clear is like the dominant position in general, even not only about banking sector, but in general in this data economy is extremely important. And the question whether it's an abuse or not, that's 
very much up to the DG competition to decide, mm -hmm. and it is a separate, like, based on the different cases. Uh, what I see is like, um, we should look at the issue also from the competition policy angle. And of course, the answer uh, in the field of payment was the Payment Services Directive 2, like very much opening the uh, infrastructure of the banks to access data for specific purposes, payment transactions. Mm -hmm. So here, um, I would not say that, okay, necessarily banks are like uh, in abuse of dominant position or necessarily in dominant position. Depends of which data you are talking about. Absolutely. Payments, it's like very much like uh, a market existing for many years. European players were like very much in forefront. And now, of course, we see American players, um, but also new other players and financial uh, technology startup also like providing other uh, uh, services and um, and so of course that's important to to mention as a banking sector that we are not against competition that's u useful for the market and of course it uh, was boosting clearly that the market of course for banks to organize themselves meaning that okay to to think about their strategy and how to open on and offer new services and, and new products um, and. The answer now is a payment services directive too, um, which is like opening this access with a, like a certain framework. Another answer to that is like the application of uh, of those programming interfaces, which is like of course through platforms and also in collaboration with some fintech startups as well. It's it's about like finding the right balance between innovation, security, competition again, like driving force for uh, drafting this payment services directive too, um, but. Security is very much at the heart of the like the debate as well, and that now it's what we see. We see now it's like clearly like PSD two is a game changer. We cannot deny that it will have an impact. Also like maybe on the approach on competition law on competition policy, but we see that there were like clearly a need to um, have an open competition here. Now it's like your question was about like okay how do you see a bit like the future, what is like the forward-looking approach. And then here we are talking about open banking. I cannot deny that the fact we are mm -hmm. we are clearly about uh, talking about open banking, starting with PSD2, but it's not only about payments here. Of course, it will be like much broader. And um, I believe it's important also to stress that the data that maybe other players uh, might want to have access are not like the raw data, the basic data that you will find in the public domain or like provided like on the on Google platform etc is like the, some tailored managed data so here is a bit would be the debate also it's like whether it's like part of the property of the banks whether or not um, it's also about questions that just how the banks will might evolve whether it's we should go in a direction of more reciprocity why not having banks maybe accessing also so like the data of google and apple etc because i think it's like just question marks i cannot tell you okay in which direction the banks will go uh, because it's linked to the business models is linked to the market but we see that the debate is not only focusing on payments is like much broader but at the same time is also the nature of the data and um, I, ha I hear usually the tendency um, of some uh, stakeholders like thinking about, okay, data is the same, banks should open up like the infrastructure, it was the same for the telecom sector, it was the same for the energy sector. Of course, they're like key examples, but when you think about those data um, owned by the banks, there's not the same kind of data. First, they have like the impact on the consumers, like really like the consumer data. But it's also about here we are talking about financial stability. So if you are not like uh, securing this access, it might have major issues. So that's why also banks are so attached to competition, innovation, because they want to position and to be competitive, but also to security. And that's why also those like uh, APIs might be a solution to go through opening the, the uh, infrastructure through a secure way. <coughs> So I don't have any solutions and I, I don't have any um, statement about what is the position of the banking sector uh, for the future. But what I can tell you, and I think we will probably touch this issue uh, uh, when we are touching also about the issue of mergers, but data is clearly at the center of the discussion, but we should look at the, the, the quality of the data, 
uh, what kind of data and for which purposes. And I think PSD2 was foc focusing on payment transactions. <laughs> I'm still questioning also like whether those players are just interested in payments transactions because they are developing even further. So that's, that's why also like how they will use in the future those data, why they would like to access them, and how banks maybe have maybe a broader <coughs> access also to, to, um, to data. So just uh, wanted also to, to take the opportunity to, to maybe react. Well, I'm very glad to be uh, the last one, actually, <laughs> because I can make not only conclusion on my own uh, opinion, but also on the whole panel. Uh, my conclusion is that from the fintech perspective, from our perspective, uh, luckily and frankly, uh, infrastructure access wasn't ever a bigger issue, which doesn't mean it's not going to be. So this kind of discussion is very important. I can very briefly uh, tell you how it worked uh, for us and what kind of infrastructure infrastructure we need to have to um, be able to access in order to provide our services. Well, we power the revolution of mobile payments in Norway. And I want to say a couple of words about the traction, uh, because that's going to be a great argument and explanation for what we are going to launch actually today. So there will be an announcement. Um, uh, the traction in Norway now is 65% of a Norwegian population is using mobile payments. That means that I haven't seen a Norwegian banknote in months. Uh, when we launch our solution with the second biggest bank in Norway, um, within the first year, million of people started to use mobile payments. That is one fifth of e each Norwegian. That is 20% of population. We have been awarded as a, as a result uh, the, by Deloitte, awarded as uh, the fastest growing fintech in Europe, Middle East and, um, um, and Africa. So that, uh, that is a great um, argument and the great proof of the fact that the access to the infrastructure wasn't a problem and that was pre-PSD2. All we needed is a strong partner, stro strong customers. In that case, it was the second biggest Norwegian bank. Uh, once they committed to us, uh, they simply opened their APIs and we did the um, inter integration that wasn't an issue. Now with PSD2, and that's a great example of great work of the legislator, uh, legislators, our task is even easier because we don't need uh, banks anymore, which doesn't mean we don't want to uh, cooperate with banks. We have always, since always, we have been offering our solution on white label basis. So banks could buy the solution, pay as they go on SaaS basis, it wasn't that expensive, and label their, uh, the, the solution with their own brand. Now with PSD2, um, the regulation that is opening APIs, uh, we don't need any customer. So actually today, please visit our website. We are launching a new solution based on our technology, but it's not anymore a white label and it's not anymore offered to banks as a customers. We are simply having this ambition of entering pan-European uh, market. We have chosen certain countries. We are going to announce uh, within a weeks which countries they are, and we are going to offer a new scheme called Settle. And basically what we is going to be said is that the scheme is there, the mobile payments are entering a given country, and we are invi inviting banks to be our partners, we are inviting telcos to be our partners, we are inviting pretty much everyone that can give us traction, because traction is the only thing we need. This, uh, the scheme is based on a well-known um, uh, setup of visa, so we have acquirers, issuers, acquirers are helping to acquire merchants, to, uh, to accept the payments, issuers are helping to um, get traction among individuals, and here we go. So um, I strongly recommend you to watch our website, our blog, and uh, watch how we uh, settle the settle, set up the settle. Um, the second uh, the infrastructure I can think of is the Google Cloud, so the fact that we operate in the cloud, and I was asked uh, by Norbert this quick question, uh, well, we have a very good cooperation to the point that we have this famous uh, customer agreement. Our uh, CEO is on the advisory board to Google. Uh, but of course, it, in theory, it may happen that Google would want to take a piece of this cake and enter the market. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the ways they could compete would be just to 
uh, seize the agreement which uh, clearly they can afford when uh, my answer to that is it will never happen. And the reason it will never happen is um, Google has uh, two main sources of income, and the first is ads, and the second is cloud computing. If Google ever shot itself in a feed by uh, seizing access to its uh, Google uh, Cloud to the potential competitors or in the market when uh, Google wants to enter, that would be the end of Google Cloud. So uh, we have a lot of trust and respect uh, to our friends from Google, uh, but at the end, at the end of the day, it's business, and in our opinion, it will never happen. Though, I talked to um, our CTO and I asked, what if? And he said, well, if uh, something like that happened, we simply move to, to another cloud uh, solution provider. And I asked, uh, can we actually do it ourselves? And he said, yes, uh, we actually don't even need to use Google. The only reason we use Google is because it's just more wise, it's more effective, it's expensive to do, uh, to do it ourselves. And I I think this is a great bridge to, it's the same with banks. You can do mobile payments yourself. It's just very difficult and very expensive. So be clever and open up to uh, fintechs. May I ask a question about that? Absolutely. You, what can you do yourself? What do you mean? Uh, the porting can, or data processing? Da data processing. Yeah, we can build course. it ourselves. It's, it would be difficult. It would be costly. That's why we have a Google. We have a lot of trust. It's a, a big renoma. We were, um, uh, yeah, we could do it according to FSA, but that doesn't mean we couldn't do it ourselves. Well, I think that uh, it's great to hear this because it's a bit, if I compare uh, your presentation or, or, or your, um, uh, your statements here with what I heard uh, two years ago at these fintech panels here in Brussels, it's great that someone is, is drawing the conclusion that you can also uh, store and process your data yourself instead of okay. uh, drawing the conclusion that you can also actually go to the cloud. So it means that there is already a, a paradigm shift there. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. I can see that this uh, discussion is getting very technical. <laughs> but as I look at the audience, I can see that the audience wants more technicalities. So I would like to touch upon the much simpler case of blockchain. <laughs> uh, and especially that there are some views that blockchain technology can be used to increase transparency in the market, which may, uh, which may raise uh, anti-competitive concerns. So I would like to ask the participants' uh, view about this. Please, now I'm glad I'm being first uh, because I'm uh, not a big fan of uh, blockchain technology. Frankly, uh, if we speak about banking and centralized system, I don't see a, I don't see a single use. Uh, where the blockchain would be a better solution than a centralized system and blockchain not being thousand times more expensive in doing so. So uh, what a blockchain is good uh, for its um, a cryptocurrency and I have again strong opinion about that. In my opinion, cryptocurrency is just a, a tool of speculation and manner of paying for illegal goods or services, and that is all it is. So this is not uh, the real money. We are being dis disruptive, we are being innovative, but we are being innovative in a clever way. So we have a lot of respect to the traditional banking and well-established uh, uh, organizations, governments, regulators, and everything else that goes behind uh, traditional, uh, t traditional money in a new, uh, offered in a new way, so through the mobile payment, uh, for example. Uh, I heard a lot of things about the blockchain. Uh, blockchain is not magic. Uh, people say it's cheaper. Well, uh, frankly, it's not. Uh, if you want to pay for, uh, micropayments are being more and more uh, popular. If you want to pay two cents for the new song on Spotify, that transaction will cost you four cents. Of course, you can do it. Does it make sense? Not really. Uh, I heard that block, uh, b b b b Bitcoin and transactions of blockchains are faster. Well, they take minutes, and actually eight of them. So if you want to buy a coffee, you would have to wait eight minutes for the transaction to be settled. Uh, is it solving any problems? I don't think so. Of course, we can say that you can build an infrastructure on the, on the top of that, so there could be an infrastructure settling those um, uh, transactions daily or weekly or monthly. 
and that is called traditional banking. So again, not really a solution uh, to anything. And uh, last but not least, uh, blockchain technology, well, two points actually. Blockchain technology is extremely um, expensive and energy consuming. And I did some research and it might be not uh, most up-to-date information, which only means that they are more dramatic now. But if you take the small traction that the Bitcoin is, is um, allowing you to have and, and compare it to the Visa, it actually, the small traction of uh, Bitcoin takes 35 times the energy that Visa takes to process all the settlements. And if you um, flip it over and you take the traction of Visa, so if we try to do Visa on Bitcoin, that would cost us energy of the entire world doing everything else on this energy. So this is not doable at all. I also hear that uh, Bitcoin, uh, b b blockchain ensures transparency and uh, b b b trust. That's not true because Bitcoin, uh, b b blockchain is just a technology enabling um, to store and <coughs> access data and historical transactions, which means that if somebody wants to record a million votes, Blockchain will take those fake million votes. If somebody wants to use a smart contract to pay a book and this book never arrives, if it happens through Visa and uh, national, uh, uh, national uh, regulated banks, uh, you can claim this book, you can, you can, uh, you can make a, a reclamation about that. If you do this over, um, over, over uh, blockchain, there is no middleman. You have nobody to complain to. So I don't think uh, blockchain is solving any real uh, problems. The ball, Naomi. Yes, so <laughs> uh, I think it's a very interesting opinion on uh, about blockchain. I would say that it was a big hype like a uh, couple of years ago and everyone was like talking about blockchain all the time. Everyone should invest in blockchain. And, um, and today we are like just as a banking sector, uh, we have uh, invested quite heavily, that's very clear, but it's not li limited to payments. As I think it should be very clear. Blockchain has like many opportunities, which is like touching post-trading, it's touching also potentially identification. It will touch maybe mortgage in the, in the future, uh, how to provide mortgage credit and like to make it like more um, auto automatized. Like it will be like, even if like through the different uh, compliance system, it would be, be quite complicated at this stage. Uh, so there's many applications of blockchain. So banks have interest, of course, to uh, be the first in innovating. So they're investing a lot in blockchain. Um, but now it's like it will. We I agree. It will not solve everything. Definitely not. Uh, it might be part of the solution. What we should look at is like the impact on the um, of the technology and to make sure that we have the capacity to innovate um, i would say like blockchain also is not only limited to uh, bitcoin like sometimes they're like a bit of confusion like people think about blockchain they think about bitcoin they think about cryptocurrency we should even not speak about cryptocurrency but crypto asset i will not enter into the debate um, you can be reassured but i mean like there's a bit of mix of discussion uh, over that what i see is like um, it's a secure network i think why it's secured because you don't have the same intermediaries and there's certain control there's no possibility to uh, enter uh, this uh, this chain and to modify the data so in this way it's secured but from the competition uh, perspective um, I think definitely um, we'll have to be careful as an industry in using blockchain to make sure that we are compliant with the competition rules because of course like uh, having different players uh, working together um, to build a, a solution, of course, that you have to look at those different rules and to make sure that there's no, um, of course, uh, any uh, negative impact uh, on antitrust. And uh, so that's the only thing uh, I would say from the banking sector side, uh, that would be something that we have to be careful of when using this technology and finding a solution as an industry and blockchain. <laughs> So, in a very easy transition to <laughs> what you just said, Noemi, and I'm glad we're going to be agreeing on this one for once. Uh, I, I think it is clear that what you said is, is 
one of the main points um, th that actually touch upon competition and the blockchain. So if we look at the blo blockchain, um, uh, so we, we've talked more from the payment side, but of course blockchain is much more than that. So if we think about, for example, smart contracts, um, how is competition looking at that? And, and Noemi is right. I mean, there's so many things within blockchain that it can get a bit confusing. I think just to keep the debate more focused, what we can say on, on blockchain. So if we think about um, the two types of, of blockchain uh, we have seen uh, in particular for smart contracts, what, what we see in there is, you know, there's, uh, there is all this transparency. And of course, when you put transparency uh, and you put perhaps oligopolies in there, it all gets uh, really interesting from a competition perspective. So what are, um, are there any new things um, to think about on, on that respect? In my view, if we think about it, um, perhaps the risks are not really new. And, and I think perhaps what is new is the technology. So if we think about the debate, it, um, the debate that has uh, occurred around blockchain and, and, and smart contracts. So if we think about um, the typical example of a cartel and collusion. So there could have been uh, an agreement between competitors, so let, let's say um, offline, and then they're going to use um, the blockchain, which is, you know, is transparent and, and it's near instant information, of course, to kind of monitor it. That could be a use. And then if you add to that the fact that you, you can do automated contracts, um, that it's a very easy way to see how one could actually... Um, find a very easy way to, um, to push um, cheating of the agreement by having, for example, an automated payment to um, retaliate if some of the companies that were in a cartel don't follow the agreement. So, but those are debates, I think, that are not really new in the core of it. It's just a new means to, to implement in that. Another one which is very interesting, and I, I am actually going to pause a little bit on it because it's, it's quite technical and it's important that the Commission, when they have to think about all these points, actually pause and think about how they're going to be doing, because I think there is risk on rushing up and saying, you know, there's a smart contract and, and there's collusion, and then let, let's uh, agree that there's going to be a problem. I think it's very important to focus the discussion on this. So if we think about tacit collusion, and that's where blockchain per perhaps is going to, to be a um, you know, a little bit different to what we have now. If you think about tacit collusion, that could be, you know, an automated way of uh, implementing a smart contract or anything else. So you say, well, there hasn't been any kind of discussion between the competitors about um, an agreement. So I think, in my view, it is very important that the Commission sees that they don't really have, as we stand, the law and the case law supporting a finding of uh, companies completely doing something um, independently without an agreement or meeting of minds or anything else, and then just finding that per because they put and they used the smart contracts and that they was all automated and they could follow each other, that is going to amount to tacit collusion. It is important that that doesn't happen automatically because I think we have previous examples in which you know the the, the court has been quite um, you know uh, open to say you still need to show that there was some kind of intention and, and that there was some kind of agreement for the companies to be doing something. So I think there is a little risk in there and that is new in here because there is more uh, an automated um, effort that that outside of the blockchain and it is important that when when authorities and the commission and the national competition authorities look at that, they step back and they see, are we seeing something new or is this really the same that we've been seeing and, and do we want to rush and, and take it to conclusions that are not really there. And then just to finish, I think just one more thing on, on the same issue. You, we could also even see um, issues, for example, of outside of the cartel area on the abuse of dominance area. So if we again go to the consor consortium uh, part and, and we see that that is a big trend now for blockchain and so consortium is going to be by definition um, different competitors all doing something all together. So if we think that there is a possibility that entering into a blockchain becomes an essential facility in an industry, let's think um, you, you really need to be in a blockchain to be able to compete with others, then of course it is quite easy to see what the problem would be there. So it would be again a problem of access to, the, to, to this blockchain. And because 
these private permission blockchains are different from, from, uh, from the public blockchain. Of course, it's going to be difficult for, for people to, to force their opening, but I think that is, however, something that the competition uh, you know, authorities, uh, national or at the commission level, could, could have a little bit more of a view. So you know how, how essential it is for a competitor to enter uh, this blockchain and and if it is essential and and the uh, the people that are inside that are inside of the blockchain are not allowing other competitors to enter then we mm -hmm. could have but again it is the same problems that we have now it is a, a typical abuse of dominance scenario it's just i think the technology makes it a bit difficult um different but um i think the the law is there is my my take on it so <coughs> I didn't expect blockchain to pop up. <laughs> <laughs> I ran a blockchain uh, summer school, a PhD school this summer, so I was hoping to. No, oh. Okay, so I think when you we talk about speak blockchain, about something else the, thing that, <laughs> the thing you need to consider is when is centralized versus a decentralized mechanism of control and governance relevant? So for some things, uh, decentralized is better, and in some cases, a centralized solution is better. So for fast uh, tr payment transactions, a centralized is much faster than others. But if you have key documents that is not, say, exchanged that often, like bill of lading, blockchain is a phenomenal solution to ensure the security instead of shuffling the bail bail of bill of lading by hand. So if you can have that in a trustworthy, decentralized solution, that is much better. And in, in many cases, in within the financial industry, the blockchain has a lot of interesting applications for uh, to the valuation of the assets, like properties. Really nice if they were decentralized, so we ever know what it was for. So I don't think we should disregard blockchain as a hype. I think it has a huge uh, potential. It's a question of learning the technology. It's relatively new, eight or say ten years old. It took the internet thirty years to become really popular. So uh, it takes time to learn to use these technologies and understand them on a deeper level. Yes, well, I completely agree with Mr. Hedman. Um, we see blockchain as uh, having a lot of potential, uh, and that's also why the, the Commission has invested in it uh, in terms of uh, an EU blockchain observatory and forum where we are discussing matters around blockchain. Uh, so, so indeed, the, 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 the potential is there, I think, uh, and of course, I mean, some issues that Natalia put on the table, we've heard before in certain specific cases, uh, mostly uh, related to public blockchains, indeed cryptocurrencies, but that is uh, not at all uh, the whole story. Um, so we're also looking at, for example, uh, innovation in blockchains uh, and in, in energy management, in, in proof of concept. With, uh, with large interest. Uh, on the collusion question, yeah, I think that, you know, as soon as uh, you're talking about a blockchain uh, operational in the financial sphere, uh, it is only logical to have consortia uh, operating together because what you're basically doing is you're taking out the, uh, the, the single intermediary. So you have consortium, and once you have a consortium with different competitors, of course, this risk theoretically uh, well, comes into existence, uh, but here, and that's why I also agree with you. Here, it's really important, you know, the governance of a permission blockchain, the formation phase of it already. There, uh, you have to have uh, uh, a discussion about okay, what can we put into uh, into such a blockchain, in, into operationalizing it, uh, and that's also where we should have discussions at the European Commission with the blockchain observatory and forum. Uh, and we're doing that. We have a working group on blockchain policy and framework conditions, where there are also people from the competition uh, uh, area active, so from the Max Planck Institute of Competition or from SEPS. So uh, that's, that's basically something that we should really uh, uh, refocus on and to, to finalize. Also, I agree with you on the skills uh, and the, uh, the, well, the learning that, that still has to happen with regulators on the blockchain. First of all, we need to understand what is it, what is the blockchain, before we then can have this meaningful discussion on what do we want a permission blockchain to be and how do we want it to be formed. Uh, personally, I think it's a very, just I couldn't uh, resist 
and mentioning this, but it, you know, in, in light of the discussion we have on these large players, for example, in the cloud uh, area, but also in the, in the digital realm, where you see really the platform economy now. And so what you see is we, we move from the like, more individual economy to the platform economy, and people say, uh, and this is me just being interested at a personal level, that we're now going into the distributed economy, uh, and I'm very curious to see what blockchain does to, to that, to the, to the online world. So I think I'm uh, looking forward with, uh, well, I have a lot of uh, uh, oh. interest and hopes to see what's going to happen there. But we have to have good discussions first, and nothing uh, is going too quickly, and of course the Commission is refraining from uh, any actions, any regulatory actions in this, uh, in this regard. It's really studying now. Uh, thank you very much. This was again very, very interesting. Uh, I just see that, uh, that we are running out of time. So we cannot have a third round of mergers, but that's not such a big problem because there have not been that many mergers that we could analyze. Uh, there was one single merger that I read on the internet. It was the one world pay merger of uh, payment processing uh, service providers, 10 billion mergers, which was notified, uh, which, which was not notified uh, with the commission, so that I don't understand. But, uh, we keep that for later. Uh, I think that, uh, that, that there are so many interesting issues coming up here. The next step probably should have a bootcamp of, uh, of fintech, you know, for a whole week, and then we could go through each of things uh, one by one. Uh, I think that I learned two things here. Uh, first, in, in the first 20 minutes, I just uh, discovered that almost everything is about data. So I think that we should. Uh, improve our, our understanding of data. Data is an input, data is an asset, the characteristics of data and how to, how to interpret them, how to evaluate them as an input, uh, how, how to think about the control of, uh, of over data going, migrating from one party to, to the other and, and which, which the right access condition should be. The other, uh, my other conclusion is that, that, that there is quite a big weight here on, on technical aspects in understanding various IT infrastructures and software, and I think that, uh, that probably commission authorities have, have a very serious homework in, in, in catching up with this, because I think that the industry is not going to, to, to wait for long, and we should prevent uh, any damages or order as soon as possible. So with this, uh, I would like to thank uh, very much for our panelists. I would like to thank uh, for the audience for the patience, and I'm happy to hand over the microphone and all this uh, headset devices with another uh, 10 minutes of installation process to the next panel. Thank you very much. Thank you.